All right, the uh, Japanese prime minister in town meeting with the president of the United States. We don't know the details of all they've talked about, but more cooperation in the Pacific, pers uh, really, to counter what we've been seeing with some of these provocative actions by China. When I think of China and how to uh, interpret what it does next, I think of this next fellow, Gordon Chang, the coming collapse of China, the great U.S.-China tech war, knows of what he speaks. Uh, Gordon, always good to see you. First on the Japanese prime minister here, and we're talking about tighter relations and more cooperation. Uh, in that neck of the woods. What does it mean, more cooperation? What, what does that mean? Well, certainly on the military front, with the announcements of changes in Japanese military policy in the middle of last month, it means that the U.S. and Japan are really equal partners. The most important thing is that the Japanese said they were going to engage in counterstrike. In other words, attacking an attacker on their homeland. And that means that Japan and the U.S. can work together. Used to be Japan would only defend the Japanese islands. The U.S. would do the tough stuff. Yeah. Now we're all going to do the tough stuff together, which means we really are at a very good point with Japan. All right. So we, we know this is in response to some pr provocative actions, even talk and language coming out of China. Um, but are they more bark than bite? Uh, a lot of people say it's in their interest not to go too far, uh, but they seem to push it. Yeah, well, the Japanese business community is certainly, we don't want to do anything about, uh, you know, provoking China. But the national security community really, I think, feels a sense of urgency because they can see China preparing for war. They know... Well, they have no doubt about that. Do yeah, they? I mean, it's, it's not only building up their military in China, but it's also trying to sanction-proof the regime and mobilizing civilians for war. So really, I think that's the most ominous aspect of this. The Japanese can see this. You know, and we all think about Taiwan as being the natural target. But I think Japan would be a more likely victim of Chinese really? aggression for a number of reasons. Right. Um, so the Japanese... Well, there's right, a lot of bad blood that goes back quite a few years, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. And also because um, it's, it's just something that riles up the Chinese people. I grew up in a... I didn't grow up in the People's Republic of China. I grew up in New Jersey. My dad came from China, and I was taught at a very young age about the horrors of World War II in Japan, because my dad was a victim of that, because he was pushed westward as the Chinese came sure. in and took Shanghai and everything. So this has really been instilled in people who are Chinese. But the People's Republic of China instills it even more so. How are they doing with COVID in China? I mean, I, I never know what numbers to trust, if I can trust any of them. Yeah, you can't trust the regime's numbers because those are obviously undercounted. Yeah. The modeling that has been done by a number of health firms basically says either 800 million infections or maybe 1.1 billion infections this winter. Deaths will be between 1 and 2 million. Um, they expect this current surge to crest in about a week, but they also are talking about a surge in mid-March. And that would make sense because we saw when under the zero COVID policies of China, which they abandoned on December 7th, this disease hit Beijing and Shanghai, two, three waves. And so it's probably this surge is going to also come back and hit these cities again. But the whole country has essentially been reopened. And that was something right. that they wanted to do. But now they're dealing with the reality that maybe, I don't know if there was middle ground there, Gordon, but, but they've got real problems. This is getting back to what it was near its height. Yes. Um, I mean, this is worse. You know, yeah. we tried to flatten the curve. Well, China compressed the curve. It's not like they intended to do that. But having those two policies, zero COVID and then no policy at all, um, you know, right back to back, no notice of it, has compressed the curve. And it's meant that there's been untold suffering, especially among the elderly Chinese. You know, when we see the cremations in the streets in places like Shanghai and elsewhere, that really says that society is broken down. Yeah, I saw that on the front page of the New York Times uh, recently where you're, you're seeing these cremations. They're not hiding the fact that it's going on. So that's pretty bad when you're at that point. Yes. And, and really, we don't know the f full effect on society, but it can't be good because right now the Chinese people are really upset. And also, yeah. you've got a downturn in the economy. The economy is contracting. It contracted last quarter. It's contracting this month. You know, um, there's not very much demand from the world for Chinese exports. And so we saw those terrible December export numbers. And, and this really means, I think, that the Chinese economy has got a long way to go to recover. It's going to be very hard. And Chinese people right now are in a foul mood. Yeah, and understandably. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon.